Well, welcome everyone to um, Bucklander Eats Salami ASMR podcast. <laughs> There's another. What? Wait a minute. You, you got another uh, a roll? What, what do they call them? Sausage? You got another shaft of salami over there? Yeah, Bucklander's chewing is drowning out my chewing. <laughs> That's good. Uh, well, welcome everyone to episode. Well, welcome everyone to book seven and eight. Episode six, though. I, you should know who we are by now if you don't. I'm Cinder Mountain Villager here with Bucklander, Jeff McNukes, and Laurentian. We are so happy that you're here. Just a little NPR smarm for you. And I guess we'll start with the outline of what has happened thus far. If you're reading at home, you'll already know this. But if you're not and just listening, start reading, you jerk. There will be some people who will strictly, you know, digest this, the entire Iliad through us. And I envy them. Uh, Hector returns to the battle already in progress. Athena and Apollo agree that they should compel Hector through the Trojan seer Helenus to challenge any brave Greek to a duel. None of the Greeks rise to the occasion and Menelaus berates them and decides to rise to the challenge, despite being a vastly inferior warrior to Hector. Agamemnon stops him. Nestor then berates the Greeks, which causes a few more warriors to rise, including big Ajax. They agree to draw lots, and Ajax draws the winning lot. Ajax and Hector fight to a standstill. They're stopped because night is falling. Both Hector and Ajax agree that this was a good duel, and now is the time to stop. They exchange gifts and depart as friends. Nestor advises Agamemnon that they should build a wall around the ships to protect themselves and the ships. Meanwhile, in Troy, Priam's council recommends that Helen and her stuff be returned to the Greeks. Paris stands up and refuses, but offers to return her stuff and sweeten the deal with some stuff of his own. The Greeks refuse that offer, but the Trojans and the Greeks do agree to a temporary truce to collect their dead and give them funeral rites. Meanwhile, on Olympus, Zeus is raging at the other gods for interfering and proclaims that he will bring an end to the war. He forbids the other gods from interfering anymore. The next day, Zeus weighs the fates on his scales. The result is doom for the Greeks. Zeus begins hurling thunderbolts at the Greeks, causing them to flee in terror while the Trojans give chase. Hera tries to convince Poseidon to join her in a plot to help the Greeks, but he refuses. The Trojans close in on the Greeks, Zeus catches Athena trying to sneak in and help her Greek friends. He tells her that Hector will continue to dominate the field until Achilles decides to return to the fight. The Greeks retreat behind their makeshift seawall, and the Trojans decide to camp around said wall to wait for the next fight and prevent the Greeks from sailing away. Now, you said here that Ajax and Hector fought to a standstill, but I got the impression that Ajax was about to win. He was kind of ahead in the fight. Well, he certainly had Hector down at least once, and he was ready to just smash him. I don't know if it was with his spear or a, a stone. I'm a little bit lost because the movie I watched, Hector beats Ajax. <laughs> <laughs> I guess that's kind of the, the beauty of this uh, having no IP, right? That uh, right. anybody can have their own interpretation. Including yeah. big Hollywood, who just decide to go for it. Is that Laurentians? Yeah, Laurentian just static buzzed us. Uh... Yeah, occasionally, occasionally Laurentian will have um, some connection issues, being that he speaks to us from a cornfield. Quite literally, yes. I'm feeding. You may hear some pigs as well, as they're they're hungry. I do hear pigs. <laughs> so we have this duel, and we have the makers of the duel, the fight promoters, which are Apollo and Athena who are on opposite sides, Athena supporting the Greeks and Apollo supporting the Trojans. They see each other in the field and decide, hey, you know, we can't keep doing this. Let's have another duel. Why they think yet another duel is going to affect any change, I don't know. But perhaps it is their choice of Hector as the challenger that will bring the viewers. Isn't the the sort of sense I, I get is that it's a bit like, well, Zeus isn't going to let us have anything decisive, so how about we just have a duel? Because that'll be a bit more, less of a waste. Or am I misreading it? No, I think, I think that's absolutely correct. 
the previous duel with Paris and Menelaus didn't work out because neither side agreed on the winner. But it was pretty clear that Menelaus won because Paris retreated. I think there is something decisive about Ajax versus Hector, though. It does swing the, the war and the morale of the two sides in a significant manner if there's a clear winner there. Yeah, and in, in the absence of Achilles, Ajax is the guy. He's their big, their big bruiser. It's kind of like, um, you know, you can fight in the desert of Afghanistan and Iraq for 20 years and not get much done. Or you could swiftly take out a key leader on one side, and then that significantly changes things. Like when we got Osama bin Laden? Uh... <laughs> and everything just kind of <laughs> petered out? Parade down uh, Park <laughs> Avenue, scouting. Oh, we won, and we yeah, we got yeah. him. <laughs> All the Islamists are like, "Damn, <laughs> uh, I guess we're going home." So yeah, I guess that is kind of a short-sighted. I think Hector kind of stood out amongst his group. Again, like Hector, again, was the hero. And you look at the Greeks and they had all these wonderful heroes against them. I don't, I don't, don't want to say Hector was alone, but he was certainly the outstanding one in the field. And the Greeks had several, you know, if Ajax didn't show up, there was still Achilles and they still had these lists of warriors. So Hector stood out amongst the Trojans and they juxtaposed that against Paris and Paris's attempt to... I don't know if we're there yet, but I'll mention it now. Paris's attempt to rectify the situation through his own virtue signaling. Right, do you mean his ma materialism, where he's like, well, I'll just give him some of my money too? Yeah, he's, again, he limp-wristed into the offer. He, he's, you know, I know we're fighting over, even just the way he negotiates or the way he contemplates about how, how he's going about doing it. You know, that should satisfy them. I don't really feel that uh, I want to give them Helen back, but, you know, everything that I stole, and, and that should keep them satisfied. He had no intention of rectifying the situation, even through trying to take back what he's already taken. Again, just a, just a portrayal of, of Troy as kind of a mealy-mouthed, a very weak, they constantly are reaffirming their weakness in the battle, even though they have the greatest strength. And that seems to motivate Hector more and more to try and be a more honorable representation of Troy. And he, ju he just doesn't have the backing. It just isn't. It isn't there behind him. And he ultimately plays into Agamemnon's game and joins the battlefield. And Hector's position is thoroughly that of a defender. He wants to protect his city more than he wants to correct his brother. That may be a little short-sighted as well, but what he's doing is generally right in that he's defending the thousands of people that live in this city that had nothing to do with this. I did a Greek mythology 101 course in university as an elective. And my professor is kind of a meta theory on Greek mythology is that every piece of Greek literature is about one main thing, which is who is noble and who is ignoble. And so we're seeing right now in the Iliad, a lot of these contrasts and comparisons. And it's like what the Greek poets are saying is that this is noble and contrast this with this guy who is being ignoble. Well, the more I read it, the more I realize that I agree with Bucklander's initial assertion that Hector is the hero of Velia. Certainly the hero of Troy. Exactly. I mean, he's the only one who's really doing anything altruistic. I think in our modern times, there might be an argument in the liberal paradigm for Paris being right here, that he's trying to settle this. So the wrong has already been done. And instead of fighting over it endlessly for honor, why don't we just settle this with an agreement of restitution, right? Reparations. It, I mean, if that's true, it just shows the naivety of the liberal position. To think that any sort of mountain of treasure is going to satiate the baying masses that are calling for reparations. They're not calling for themselves to receive money. They're calling for money to be stripped away from those who they perceive as having slighted them or insulted them. But it's not even about money. It's more about Helen than anything else. There is a shift in this book, or in, in book eight. It's quite interesting. There's these three moments where no one talks. It talks about, like, people are just quiet. And one is when the guy says to Paris, like, hey, how about we, uh, how about we fix this problem? 
And Paris is like, wow, that was really stupid what you just said. <laughs> Although Paris is a piece of shit. And actually, the guy is right. Like, if we want this to be over, we know what we need to do. We need to give back Helen. Or at least that's what we needed to do. Because then when they send out the delegation to the Greeks, the Greeks listen and they go, no, we know that we have you now and we're going to get you. And you giving us, just giving us money isn't good enough. Even if, especially once they'd made that offer, it was like a, a revelation of their weakness, revealing their weakness. And then even now, who knows what they would have said if, if Helen had been included in that deal. But now the Greeks know that they're willing to buy their way out. So even if Helen is on the table, I feel like they'd be like, no. I think so, too. You have this really cool little section when the delegation is giving the offer and the Greeks have rejected it. Diomedes, who's been pretty successful up to now, stands up and says this. At this stage, let no one accept Paris's offer of possessions or Helen either. Any fool can see the Trojans' doom is sealed. At this point, it's like, we have you on your heels. You're, you're, you've turned tail. We've got you. So let's press the attack. At this point, they've lost people. It's more than, as you said, Paris stealing Helen. It's now, we will only accept the destruction of Troy and the rape of your women and the murder of your sons, which I would argue is where we're at with the BIPOC community from the leftist position. <laughs> calling out for reparations. They're not calling for reparations. No. They're calling for genocide. They're calling for power and complete submission. And that even though you could, be, you could make an argument that they're already morally defeated through Paris's weaknesses, Priam's weaknesses, and even Hector's weaknesses, to stand alone, to be the one with honor, to represent his community, to defend it. Well, to defend their, their morals, to defend their moral structure to project that they have a moral structure. But I'm not of the understanding that Troy is built on honor. Troy is built on walls, and they hide behind those walls, and they can do whatever they like behind those walls. But as soon as you're a man of honor and you go outside those walls, it's a different story out there. There's Greeks, there's gods, there's people, and you have to be accountable for it. And Hector was willing to do that, but he didn't have the support behind him. He didn't have the moral support behind him with his brother, with his family, with other members. There was arguably, there was a contingent of Trojans that were, were there to help them, other honorable men. But, but Hector was really the one that stood alone in his leadership. So you could argue in my mind that the Trojans actually had uh, the upper hand, despite Diomedes' understanding of the situation. The Trojans had already turned and run. They were already behind the eight ball. They'd already lost morally looking through the moral compass, but technologically they were further ahead. Maybe they could have lasted another nine years. They totally could. From a strategic point of view, the Greeks could only fight them on the seaside. They only had enough men to attack one side of the fortress city. The other side was open. Troy, this entire time, is still receiving supplies from surrounding areas. So the, the siege could have lasted indefinitely. As long as the Greeks were there, they could have withstood the siege. So water was still coming in, food was still coming in, weapons, uh, materiel. It's a weird way of conducting a siege. I wonder if that isn't something to do with some guarantee a god gave them or something to say, look, just go and you'll get it. Well, again, I think, I think it was book two. Agamemnon gets that dream from, from Zeus uh, that says you're going to take the city. So I imagine the politics of Olympus would keep both sides committed to the conflict, as stupid as strategically or tactically the conflict got. And it's really only a question of who has more men to lose. So shifting a little bit, but keeping with the moral structure, it appears that the leaders, the leaders are the ones with questionable morals. Uh, and that includes sort of their periphery, like their princes, their sons. Because in this fight between Ajax and Hector, there seems to be a certain amount of chivalry. In the beginning, it's, yeah, I'm going to fight you and I'm going to kill you. I'm going to take your armor and wear it. When an attendant comes and says, hey, we should stop this fight. It's going to be nighttime. Ajax says, okay, what does Hector say? Because Hector issued the challenge, so he should make the call. Hector agrees, yeah, let's stop this fight. 
by the way, a nice fight. Ajax says, yeah, yeah, that was a good fight. Let's exchange gifts. And they give each other presents out of respect. And at least the books say that they parted, quote unquote, as friends. And that's kind of interesting, considering they were trying to crush each other's skulls with rocks like 10 minutes ago. <laughs> Nowadays, we see something similar in the UFC, where two guys talk about how bad their opponent is, kind of a rotten person he is, and what kind of a generate fighter he is, and then beat each other up for 15 minutes. And then afterwards, it's like, oh, yeah, you know, that, that was all, all uh, before. That's all in the past. We've, we buried it. They shake hands. They hug. Always exchange words right after they fight. <laughs> Maybe some of that is show, I think. Some of that is, um, see, you know, we're, we're honorable men. We respect the rules of the warrior way. Some of that is, could also be recognition of your equal or your peers. It's like through the process of battling, you kind of separate the pretenders from the contenders. And when you're like a high-level warrior, like a Hector, Ajax, or like a Conor McGregor, <laughs> You don't meet very many of your peers and your equals. When you do, it's like, add respect. It's a sort of circumstantial or situational empathy. We walk the same path, though we might be in different directions. And there's an appreciation there, with which I, I, I like. And we certainly don't have that between Agamemnon and Priam. But you would think that, like, they would have some sort of respect for one another because they were both kings need to get them in the cage for 25 minutes, and then they'll respect each other. That was the duel that we needed to see. <laughs> it's a bit like guys who go to Iraq, and they come back, and they have their old friends, but they just don't understand them in a way as well. It's a similar thing. No one understands me unless they've been there. Absolutely. It's, um, I've heard a few stories like that. People might think that they know us, but unless you've done cannon fodder. <laughs> <laughs> this is basically like being in the trenches. You know, this is just like it. We're, we're essentially warriors. We had um, an Ohio politician compare the January 6th insurrection to 9-11, which was pretty interesting. That's not really relevant, but... Speaking of modern politics, though, is there a reason why the same mutual respect doesn't exist between, say, the Proud Boys and Antifa? Because it's total war. It's not total war yet in terms of like Antifa's going to bomb Dresden, but... The mentality. The mentality among these sides. Yes. And, and actually, I think the Proud Boys are prepared to kind of like backslap and, hey, you got me with a good one there, you pink-haired faggot. But, um, <laughs> but like, it's, it's Antifa. It's Antifa that don't want to go to that step and that's what i think you see in this book is that it's like the duel with hector and ajax is the last moment before total war what did you ask jeff why why does, why that mutual respect doesn't develop between the two sides in modern politics well and ag again i'll say that the mentality and i will agree with bucklander's assertion that the mentality is total war and you have one side that has been for lack of a better term, indoctrinated constantly that the only way to deal with this percentage of society who equip your oppressors is to destroy them. But first we demoralize them, but eventually we're going to have to liquidate them. And they're trying to do it with all these subversive tactics, but eventually, eventually the long knives have to come out. Um, and there's such a, a hatred and a boiling constantly within that community of this re reaffirmation of their grievance within their communities. And then on the Proud Boys side, we have this constantly watching YouTube videos of Antifa and aligned organizations hurting people, hurting old men, scaring children, hurting women. Uh, we get all this footage of groups that they support and are aligned with hurting innocent people, carjacking, and, and we see that and that poisons their soul. It poisons their disposition. So there is no honor in those groups. There's no honor in attacking defenseless, unarmed people. There's no honor in attacking a fairly nonviolent, if, in, if entirely nonviolent, way of life. You're trying to turn someone's very existence into a positive act or a proactive act of oppression. There's such a poisoning against either side, which causes very real hatred 
you can't respect someone you hate. Yeah, I, I've actually been thinking about this hatred and anger recently. And I think if there's a more less emotionally uh, loaded way of thinking about it, one of the ways that I like to look at it, even though I know other people might not agree, <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, you have these two sides, these two diametrically opposed ways of living, you know, essentially the left and the right, right? And we could look at it and say, oh, look at these terrible people. Doesn't this boil your blood? Don't you want to just destroy these people? But we could look at it and say, you know, this is kind of like a battle that's gone on for most of man's history. It's just the way it is. It's like a matter of fact. There are always these two forces within hu humankind, right? This kind of liberation theology. We're being oppressed by these traditions and these patriarchs. And then there's this other side, the pronomian side. There, these two sides are always at odds with each other. So we, we could get very angry and hate-filled about this, or we could just look at this as a matter of fact. This is just an eternal battle that we're taking part in. There's no need to be angry at each other. This is just how it is. To tie it back to the Iliad, it's like, maybe to some degree the Greeks and the Trojans do hate each other, but at the same time, in those times especially, there's also this notion that war is inevitable, and it just happens. And so we don't have to always despise our enemies. Sometimes circumstances just bring us into war. So there can be respect between warriors. To your point, I think there was a moral shifting that we observed in Book 7. So in the beginning, Troy was on the side of having stolen Helen, and the Greeks were coming to get Helen. And now it's shifted. The Greeks don't even want Helen. We want your city and everyone in it. And I think maybe in history, to tie it then back to contemporary politics, there maybe was an oppressive system that existed and one faction wanted to get rid of it. Now that's happened, more or less, and that system wants you. They want our cities, they want, our, they want your family, they want your kids now. That's their revenge, is we're going to raise them as fully automated, luxury, gay space communists. And that's their revenge, is their revenge is to take your children and rape your wives. They either don't know what the game is, or they won't admit what the game is. My frustration continually with the far left is like, it's not so much what they do, but so much as like this expectation that like, well, if you're going to do that sort of thing, we, we should get to do that sort of thing. But they're very good at sort of, we can do whatever we want. We can do this stuff. We can have a paramilitary organization, but your hands are tied. Don't you dare think about having anything that might rival Antifa. So what's annoying about that is this sort of idea of, like, the fair play. Because there isn't fair play. Because they know they'd lose if there was fair play. It's another version of what you're talking about, of this, like, why can't we just sort of sit there and say, like, look, you're on that side, I'm on this side, and, you know, have some respect for each other. Well, it's another symptom of total war. In a way, the First World War isn't total war. And this is one of the notes I had for this week. Justifications to hate. You know, Menelaus and Paris. Yeah, Menelaus is justified in hating Paris. Menelaus hating Hector. I understand why he would hate Hector, but it's not justified in the same way as Paris. But Ajax versus Hector, they don't hate each other because it's not it's not total war they're, and they're reasonably and you know the first world war you can have guys getting out of the trenches to play football with one another but you can't have that with like antifa and the proud boys my notes said my notes said the u.s army and the taliban as much as i i was gonna say i have nothing against the taliban personally <laughs> <laughs> they never did anything to me um no <laughs> they're, look they're good people they're just even, on the wrong even, they're on the wrong side of history that's the only the the taliban understands their position like if you look at look at what a group of unarmed right-wingers did during their protest versus what antifa does they burn down some buildings they break down storefronts they assault an elderly white man Unarmed right-wingers take the national capital. They wander in and take photos where the cathedral works, or at least one of the wings of the cathedral. And they take a podium. And they take a podium. 
I mean, strategically speaking, even though it's not total war, that is a much better strategy if victory was what you're going for. Now, the backlash is something else entirely, but I wouldn't compare Antifa with the Taliban because the Taliban was a semi-functional system of government before the United States took a side in the Afghan civil war. Something like Antifa is this weird hodgepodge of rejects that just want to do violence. So I don't, I don't know that I could compare them. I don't have a, a dynamic equivalent, organizationally speaking, to compare them to. This is the way I'll put it. This is a theater, what we saw with the Proud Boys and Antifa. It was clearly a staged event, maybe not by the Proud Boys themselves. There's an argument that it is that they each showed up with the proper weapons to at least perform. It, it could be argued that it's it was well organized, that these were displays of theatrics by, say, by the gods, by our modern gods. You could also say that Antifa was there to bring Hector out of his castle. You know, modern society, we have these, you know, the 1776 liberals, as we'll call them, the Republicans, they have a pretty safe wall to stay behind. And it took somebody of the egregious act of Antifa to bring them out from behind their wall. They needed some pretty darn good reason to get out and organize. Who was organizing them, we don't know. But Antifa was there to bring them out to create this theatrical presentation of some kind of right-wing resistance, which we know was an ultimate farce. Nobody brought anything productive on the side of the right. All that was done was these people that joined these protests and beat up these Antifa members. They were just doxxed and thrown in jail. It was a complete production that maybe had to get played out because somebody would have taken that mantra eventually to stand up to Antifa. Whereas maybe the proper direction was just to say, as Jeff said, is to not play into that at all and resign yourself to just letting things be the way they are. And, you know, if Antifa decides to burn down and vandalize homes and abuse old people, it just looks bad on them. But if you show up and beat the shit out of them, I don't know, are you really doing anything? Are you really accomplishing anything for your movement or ideology? That's the question. And again, I'll tie that back to Hector. Hector was the only one you know, Paris was mealy-mouthed and Priam in their negotiations. They did; they weren't even honest about their negotiations. And Helen was almost this ruse at that point, just to get them out from behind their wall. So there is some stark contrast, and I'm I'm glad you brought that up, Cinder. That there's there definitely is a some kind of eternal battle, and honor is used as as leverage in these battles. I, I see another parallel here, actually. In a way, the Olympians ultimately decide who's going to win this war. So when Hector and Ajax meet on the battlefield, I mean, it's serious, but it, it's also ultimately still kind of gesturing towards those who are truly in power. <laughs> we're fighting because Athena and Apollo told us to. And we're going to show our valor, but also prove something to the gods. And in the same sense, it's like when Antifa and Proud Boys meet. They have to, well, maybe they don't, but... It would be productive to re to recognize that ultimately it leads nowhere, except for how the ruling oligarchs want to use it. Antifa, at least, doing something productive towards their cause in the sense that they're doing what their masters are telling them to do. In that sense, it empowers their masters to use that towards the narrative. Because with Proud Boys, if Proud Boys think that beating up Antifa on the streets is going to somehow help their cause, then they're the ones who are mistaken. They're the ones being played. They're truly the ones losing out of this because we all know the, these human rights advocates that are joining with Antifa, they don't have any stake in the game. What are they going to lose? I, I don't know where most of these kids come from, but they're scraping the pretty bottom of the barrel when they're recruiting these activists to take arms against, you could say, police squads and burn down cars. I mean, I'm sure there was some capable actors amongst their ranks, but these kids kind of, I think they kind of knew they were going to get off because they had to. I don't know if any of these people had any stake in the world at this point. And that fits to the MO of, of the powers, you know, the Olympians. They've just recruited the lowest of the low and they gave them party favors in order to do these heinous acts just to bring out, to continue the narrative of, of hatred that the Proud Boys have or could have. There's a lot of parallels there. I think that's a good choice. 
Well, and I think too that there is this um, form of manipulation that the elites on Olympus take in getting men, mortals, to do their bidding. So when Jeff said it was Athena and Apollo, what Athena and Apollo did was compel Hellenus, the seer, prophet, you know, counselor, whatever you want to say, of the Trojans, to compel Hector to fight a duel. It wasn't Athena appeared to Hector or Apollo appeared to Hector and saying, hey, if you believe in who I am as a god, if you love me like I love you, you will do this, or I command you to do this for my glory and, and your eternal soul. It's like, no, we're going to compel somebody to tell you a lie to get you to do this thing. You know, there's these degrees of separation. We see that with Antifa. You know, it's not George Soros getting on the horn, taking over the TV screens and saying, it's time, brothers and sisters, the great society is at hand. It's mm -hmm. no, he's paying this person who's paying this person who's releasing this material, who's releasing these videos, and it leaks down to these groups. I mean, they still have the sanction of the power base of Olympus, but they're not standing up as a god, as a leader, as an object of worship and saying, do this because I command thee. And there's no responsibility. Right. Because when it comes time, if we win, right, if the right wing wins, I mean, yeah, we're going to put George Soros on trial for war crimes, but... <laughs> All of these intermediaries will say, well, don't look at me. This guy told me to do it. And don't look at me. I was just getting some funding from Soros for, for this thing, right? All of these people who, who have no responsibility at the end. Very few people are actually going to be found guilty. Yes. And I think Bucklander should be one of them because he's watching a sports game during recording. <laughs> it's just nationalism. That's what you keep saying. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care about the soccer. Well, and to a certain extent, um, the Trojans and the Greeks are supporting nationalism because the Trojan cause is to expel the Greeks and the Greek cause is to crush the Trojans. Their avatars, Hector and Achilles, Achilles is an attacker. He's, he's an offensive figure. And Hector is a defender. He's a defensive figure. These are their heroes. I don't want to get too technical, but I don't know that I would say it's nationalism. It's something else. This is motivated by personal relationships, not allegiance to an abstract. But look at John Everyman, Eos, in the front line of the Greeks. To him, it's national. I'm here with all my Greek brothers and sisters, or mostly brothers, or if all the brothers. I'm here with my Greek brothers to fight the Trojans. Everybody, though, however, is divided into these units, right? It's like, oh, this is the, the contingent from this area of Greece. Sure. This is, yeah, we follow this king. There is a hierarchy also of personal relationships. This is Nestor's crew, and then Nestor is, you know, loyal to Agamemnon. So there's this, like, chain of loyalty, personal relationships. What is the term for nationalism but on a civilizational level? Hmm. Um... Well, yeah, it's something that, that's forgotten by modern man, I guess. Well, I don't know that they ever had it. I yeah. mean, so there's a book called Clash of Civilizations, and he said that you know, we had the clash of nations, we had the clash of ideologies, and now we're going into the clash of civilizations. I think I have that right. That you're going to have Islam versus the West and China versus the West. It's not communist China. It's like the Sino part of China, that that is why we're coming to conflict with China. It's not because China is communist. It's a different civilization. So, I mean, that's where we're going, according to him. I don't know if I buy that. I would say the word doesn't exist yet, Cinder, and that if he's right, that word will be created out of necessity. I don't just want to say, like, civilizationalist. That feels lazy. It does, yeah. And just imprecise. Too broad. Something along these lines came up in our Discord this week, too, which is that in regards to what Laos you said about Confucius, it's like, by the time you need something called filial piety, something has already been lost. In a, an organic, let's say, father-son relationship, there's no none of this like concept of filial piety. There's more like father and son, you know, being father and son. By the time you need to formalize it and name it, there's been a breakdown in the original father-son relationship. And now you have to tell your son, oh, you have to be pious to your father. Right. And it's it's been lost for so long that you, you sort of have to create this terminology that's so functionally abstract. You have to bureaucratize it. Yes. 
And then by then it's too late. I mean, it's too late for the immediate generation, but if you committed to that for 200 years, something like father and son could then come about again. But I mean, you're out of luck personally. So it's like the time we have to call it nationalism. It's because the organic order has already been lost. Yeah, and I guess I'm wrong too when I say it's a different civilization because Troy worships all the same gods. Uh, you know, they're not worshiping like the Zoroastrian or Babylonian gods or any of those Sumerian gods. They're they're worshiping the Greek gods. So you could say that it's the same civilization. And the Greek, this, those same Greek gods also still reciprocate back to Troy. Right. Yep. So are they fighting for? Agamemnon and Priam? Are they fighting for what they represent or what material wealth that could come of their great deeds in front of their leaders? I, I don't think the average soldier there is fighting for Agamemnon or Priam. They're fighting for a guy who is fighting for them, or there's some sort of chain because they have relationships with a guy who has a relationship with a guy who has a relationship with Priam or Agamemnon. But they're there for the money, I think, as well. But still, you need you need a good re. You know, this is the thing: is that they're wavering when when the Iliad starts. You know, shouldn't we just go home already? You know, we're not getting money, and so it's a combination of things that they're being appealed to, and then part of it's the relationships, and part of it's personal enrichment. So this sports ball game that you're watching. These are also soldiers that are in it for the money because you're watching England and De Denmark. Oh, they demonstrably are. They demonstrably are. And they're not in it for love of nation because I guarantee you ha half the fucking team hates England and what England represents. <laughs> Just like that thing. It's, it's not because I like this, this England team. It's not 1966 where everyone out there is English and loves England and loves the Queen. This is a just a way of putting a thumb in Germany's eye. And it's more schadenfreude at the other teams as much as anything else. Do you see the thing about the U.S. women's team playing Mexico? And, like, just on the 4th of July, like, the players just ignoring, two or three of the players just ignored. Turning their backs on the flag. A veteran was, was singing the national anthem, right? He was playing it on the harmonica. On his harmonica. It doesn't really get more American. And they turn their backs on the flag on the 4th of July. I have never seen such a clear sign of civilizational decline. I mean, it's like a, a crack down the center of the foundation that's about to cause a cave-in. You know what it is? It's Rome getting in Goths to fight their battles for them. I would say it's even further than that. And then the Goths oh, don't give a shit about Rome. What a surprise. It's all that, but it's the local guards leaving the key to the front gate purposely in the door. It's the guards saying, it doesn't matter if Rome gets sacked because this place sucks anyway and deserves to be sacked. It is the most blatant symbol of, de of coming destruction I've ever mm. seen. Um, sorry, that that's sort of a divergence because there's no there's nothing like that coming from the greeks or the trojans nobody is actively trying to destroy their own society i question just to keep going on this are these people even part of a nation are they are they post-national like who are these these people that play for these teams like they're university educated if you get a position on a national team You've probably got, you know, in the case of the men, you've probably got full-time professional support. If you're a woman or even a, a lower amateur man uh, in the Olympics, say, because the Olympics are coming up, you've probably got maybe a political future involved in, in the human rights uh, field and your your school, your university, your, your representative for your, for your university, although you may not actually be that bright. Um, or or even well educated for that matter. So these people, I don't even I don't even consider them that they're part of a nation. They're maybe some of them represent more ideology, and and they're showing that to everybody that we're not part of the United States. We're you know we fly the AIDS flag, and that's our flag, and that's our flag because nothing's ever equal. Because you know our our human rights will never be equalized. We can never 
rectify history. So we're going to continue to be this problem. I do think they are part of some group. The, the nation that they ascribe to is Wakanda. Which is, when you say that, this idea, this like imaginary ideal nation. Yeah, it doesn't exist. This utopia that doesn't exist, that, that, that lives in their, their own minds and not their acts and duties. This, it's this, abs- again, this abstract morality that doesn't exist. It doesn't ex- never existed in history. It doesn't exist in any spiritual text. It just exists in their own minds, and they're, they're willing to fight and die for it while being tools for the gods in, in some cases. They're, they're willing to fight and die for things that they don't even understand. And speaking of tools for the gods, we see this unique time, at least thus far, when Zeus stands up and rages at all the other gods for interfering in this battle, in this war and making the proclamation that I will end this war soon, and you are not to interfere anymore. It's about damn time. About damn time. <laughs> he centralizes power. He picks power up. Yeah, this was actually uh, the point that I, I highlighted in, in my notes. It kind of like paints the picture perfectly that monarchy is the way to finally get rid of the oligarchy. Get rid of the, the anarcho-tyranny of oligarchy. You need a monarch need to actually re-centralize. Someone has to put their foot down and say enough of this politicking and backroom dealings. It's not going to end all of it, but this centralized position is the best way to do it. And even then, Zeus goes to Mount Ida to his little bachelor getaway and weighs the fates. So he doesn't even decide necessarily what he's going to do based on what he wants to do. He pulls out his scale and puts the Trojans and Greeks on this scale. And the fates decide. At the very least, it's his job to execute. Right. So he doesn't necessarily judge, but when the outcome is decided, he does carry out judgment, which puts the uh, the Greeks on their heels. And, uh, I put it here in my notes. It's kind of like oligarchy is like mommy and daddy contradicting each other. And it just leads to this mass confusion where the kids get dragged into the politics of mommy and daddy. So we see that today, where there is no de- de- no no space in today's society for deep politicization. We all get dragged into this because mommy and daddy are fighting. It's like even if you're a neutral, even if you take try to take a neutral position on, on any issue, you can't without being a, a bad guy. You can't without social expectation. It's like, oh, how dare you not take an, a stand on abortion? How dare you not take a stand on BLM? Dude, silence is violence. Yeah, silence is violence. Everything be- gets dragged into the mommy and daddy fighting. Everything becomes an issue of whether you're taking mommy's side or daddy's side. So Zeus finally shows what it means to be the man of the house. And so now, now that daddy's in charge, there's no more of this, right? The correct position on BLM's position is dad's position. His dad runs the house. We got a hint of this in book one, where Zeus tells Hera, like... Don't even try to do what I do, darling. (laughs) But he's been sitting there for too long. He should have just done this a while ago, as you say. It speaks to his indecision. And Jeff wrote in his notes about that indecision, that he's still contemplating. He's a man of action. He has the power, but he doesn't necessarily follow through with it right away. He's indecisive because there's all these other factors all these other gods how is he going to pay for it you know what's the trick what's going to be the administrative fee for my decision right he's the big daddy but he's still living in an oligarchical system of corruption what's he contemplating he's still in that within the world of the pagan gods where he's there's still corruption will exist he can't he's not going to make he's not able to make this decision in a vacuum he knows ultimately it will be his his decision will be the best one, but he takes his time to do it, et cetera, et cetera. This is the thing. There is no such thing as absolute monarchy. There just isn't. And 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 whatever Yarvin writes about this, it's one thing, but even Versailles is built upon getting the nobles to go along with it. And I think, like, Pearl that is messed up about Zeus and he should have done this a while ago. He's a king, but even kings have to respond to public opinion. And maybe it's that 
he realizes they've seen now what it is for them to get their way and to fuck about. Now I can finally just say, now I'm taking control because you guys, you see now why I need to take control. There's not going to be any resolution to this if I just let you do what you've been doing all along. If you're smashing the house, if you're destroying things, we won't have any nice things. So daddy's going to put a stop to it right now. Go to bed. <laughs> Quit fucking, you know, it's bedtime. You're cranky. That's enough. You know, I don't care if mommy told you you could watch Paw Patrol. It's over. <laughs> <laughs> I haven't read ahead, so I don't know how this turns out. But I, at least in this moment, I, I'm so thankful that Zeus is stepping in. Well, <laughs> Zeus wants Troy to survive. But uh, even he, he, even that desire is not going to um, help out Troy. And I think, largely speaking, Zeus is the only one that really wants Troy to survive. Because Apollo is only on Troy's side because he feels slighted by the Greeks. Well, Apollo, no, Apollo likes Troy. They all, they all have, a, have a soft spot for Troy. But Apollo just gets really pissed at the Greeks when they don't give him the respect that he deserves. So I think Apollo is still... Still on their side, in their camp, voting in favor. I was going to ask what it would have looked like for Trump to go Zeus when we needed him to. Zeusy. It would have been him leading the Capitol Hill. The Jan, the Jan 6 armed, lethally armed insurrection. He should have done something way before Jan 6. He should have done something in Jan 6, 2016. <laughs> yeah, I, I would agree with that. <laughs> well, he should have done He should have done uh, one quarter of the things he was going to do. He should have actually drained the swamp. Yeah. Again, you know, could he drain the swamp? And I think it's one understanding that we have over, say, our counterparts in the populist camp that there's an argument to be made that he couldn't have. That the amount of the amount of backlash that we'd face, we I don't know if anybody would want to live in that world. Well, look at it this way. If Trump went to war with the deep state, who would be the one being hurled from Mount Olympus into Tartarus? It would actually be Trump and not the, 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 the swamp monsters. Because the deep state is Olympus. The structure of the stronghold was built by the idea of the deep state. To drain the swamp would mean you'd have to dig up a mountain. There's no way it could happen. Well, there is a way, but that's a separate conversation. And that's the... That's paywalled. That's paywalled. <laughs> and that's the, you know, the velvet revolution that we've heard discussed. But we're not in that. We're in total war in, in the Iliad. And this is how these things were settled. Who's to say that if that's not a, a better way to settle things? We don't know. We haven't gotten to the end of the book. But we're really starting to see how things are playing out and who's involved, who's really pulling the trigger and uh, the chaos that that can bring. Well, hopefully now that Zeus has assumed total control of the reins, he will bring some order to this chaos. Do we have any closing statements, gentlemen? Only to say that what was needed then is needed now. We need someone to assume control. Klaus Schwab? That is a human being. Uh I look at also the fact that the oligarchs nowadays don't want that responsibility. They don't want to be the one who to wrangle all the other oligarchs and say, do not dare oppose me. I would rather sit back and say, oh, things are just happening because it's progress. It's a social evolution, you know, the natural arc of history. So they want the veneration, but not the responsibility. There's even an argument to be made that they, they can't, that they don't know how, that is that they're so programmed for clerical work, there's, there's no capacity for leadership. I'd even get into the argument of, say, maybe the wrong, the wrong sex is, uh, is doing the work. It's all clerical work that they can do. There's, there is no fight. The fight is, is of a bureaucratic nature because your warriors just aren't geared in that direction. They're geared for empathy, not battle. We'd like to thank everyone for joining us. Please join us on ironagearchive.com. Uh, you want to give a shout out, Bucklander, to the salami brand that you're enjoying while I give this outro? Um, 
Mm, well, I, don't, I think it's just uh, we don't we don't know where the, what their stance on yeah. issues is right now. So, well, <laughs> well we got to start dragging them into this fight, kicking and screaming. <laughs> My rainbow branded salami. <laughs> it's pride yeah. salami. It's <laughs> pride. Um, That's a good name for a band. Pride salami. <laughs> I don't know if I'd go to that show. Definitely would buy some of their merch though. Okay, well, thank you, everyone, and uh, we hope to see you next week because we're always watching The End.